1. D. Driver. 20-year-old boy, kind of a mooch, womanizer, was using me for sex and free rent. I was unhealthily dependent on him after a previous boyfriend passed away. FP, front passenger. 18-year-old girl, really sweet. I thought she was the next target of driver's wandering dick. She let me know she wasn't interested. BFF, best fucking friend. 23-year-old girl, dumbass, took her four tries to get her license. This story will help explain why she probably needed five. At the time of the accident, she only had her license for less than a day. Me, 19 years old at the time. Uh, I enjoy long walks on the beach and romantic dinners. In October 2013, I was ejected from a rolling vehicle and landed on my butt. It was an 88 Ford Bronco 2. Me and the driver went to West Virginia on Friday. Brought the Bronco back Monday and wrecked it Thursday. The accident happened between Yellow Springs and Fairborn, Ohio. That night we had picked up front passenger from her house and were at a coffee shop in Yellow Springs enjoying an open mic. My BFF had driven herself and a friend over. She had a stash of beer and who knows what else. I don't know if she drank any of it before driving that night, but I'm not sure. Then the activities ended and we all decided to get McDonald's the next town over. Before I got into the car on that fateful night, as I was moving the front seat forward, I heard a voice pop in my head that said, you should really sit in the back. Normal people hear voices and they think they're crazy. My reaction was, yeah, front passenger's not after my boyfriend, so why not? The voice spoke so clearly and came from the back of my head or maybe even from behind me. I did not recognize the voice either. So I turned around and offered FP the front seat. And then the world just felt... off. Like for a split second it felt like the world paused and that we had made a change to the universe and timeline or something. Then everything seemed normal and FP said, Yeah, and that way I can smoke. And the driver said, Yeah, that way you can get out of the car easier. So I hop in the back seat and FP hops in the front. Note the front seat belt was faulty. D had rolled the Bronco years before, just broke the windows and front seat belt. It was now currently held together by a carabiner clip and a dog leash hook. Super safe, yo. I couldn't find the seat belt in the back seat, so I just thought the car was so old it didn't have one. I'm very book smart. And that's about it. The three of us were pulling out, and then stopped at the stop sign in front of the coffee shop. BFF pulled out of the parking lot, and for some reason, decided to swerve around us and go speeding through the stop sign. The crowd outside of the coffee shop was yelling at her and we were like, man, what's her problem? Man, I wonder why it took her four tries to get her license. I think she was trying to race us. She was always saying, let's race, guys. And I'd be like, yeah, I kind of like living. Thanks, though. So we're in the Bronco heading down the road and we caught up to BFF. D, for some reason, decided to pass her and then speed up. I think he later said she was driving too slow. For some fucking reason, BFF decided to pass us again. Her later claim was that she thought D was driving too fast, and that she was trying to get in front to make us slow down. So she's trying to pass us, and I can see that her rear bumper was between our front bumper and front tire as we're going over the white line. Driver swerved to avoid a collision. I looked forward and see the front passenger and my driver bouncing side to side. I thought, oh, we'll be fine. Driver will regain control. And then I looked out the left window and saw the ground coming up and thought, oh, shit. And we rolled three or four times. I could feel us flipping, but everything was black and I couldn't see anything. I don't know if it was physics, G-forces, or something else causing me not to see. Who knows? After the third roll, I felt something grab me by the shoulders. I felt this force on my shoulders pulling me up and out of the car. Once I had been ejected from the vehicle, I could see again. I felt that pressure on my shoulders as I was flying through the air. And the moment the gravity took over and I was falling down, the feeling on my shoulders disappeared. Whatever grabbed me just dropped me on my ass. Better than my face, though. As I was on the ground, I was thinking, okay, okay, let's wiggle our toes. Good, we can wiggle our toes. We're not paralyzed, okay? Now scream. Good, we're screaming. We can get help. 
Then the driver somehow got out of the Bronco and he ran over to me and asked if I was okay. I said, yeah, I think so. He then had a look of fear in his eyes and said, I can't find front passenger. I told him to go find her, he goes screaming for her, and somehow my phone was still in my pocket. Oh my god, so it was my first iPhone, a 5C. I had it for a month or two at this point. I knew it had Siri, so I tried to use it. But my data was turned off since my dad and I only had 4 gigs at the time to share. Siri, call 911. I'm sorry, but I do not have service. Siri, you bitch. I ended up dialing 911 by hand, but damn Siri, you could have saved me the struggle. I heard the driver a bit away from me talking to them too. As I was on the phone, I yelled for driver, and he comes rushing over to me. What's wrong? Do you have your knife on you? Yes. Can you cut off my bra? My chest hurts. I was having a hard time breathing and thought my ribs were broken. And I knew they were going to cut my clothes off anyway, so I figured we'd just get it started for them. Then I asked him to bend my leg because it really hurt, and somehow bending it at the hip made it feel better. 911 stayed on the line with me until the first responders came. The driver led the paramedics over to me and said he found the front passenger and she was unconscious. They looked at me, but I guess since I was awake they took her first. Then as I was laying there and people were walking around, best fucking friend called me on my phone. She had kept fucking driving. So, hey, um, are you guys okay? No, we're fucking not. We fucking crashed. Oh my god, oh my god, well, I'm not going to jail for this. At that point, I looked at my phone and thought, WTF. That's when the driver and the sheriff, paramedic, I can't remember, walked up to me. Okay, they're coming to take you now. Who are you talking to? I told him I was talking to BFF, and he took the phone. BFF? BFF? You nearly killed us. That's when the paramedics got me, and I didn't hear any more. But I guess BFF hung up and the sheriff called her back from my phone a few times and told her she needed to come back. She finally went back after an hour had passed. I wonder if she had been drinking and she used that time to sober up, or maybe she's just a shit driver, who knows. On the way to the hospital was horrible. I felt every bump in the ground and was in immense pain. To help relieve the pain, I was doing a weird animalistic grunting and moaning. I have difficult to find veins, and it took what felt like five minutes for them to get me pain reliever. As they were poking around, my vision started to get weird. The edges were turning white, and I could feel my body trying to pass out. But I told myself not to and fought it off because I thought I might have a concussion. They finally poked me, and the whiteness went away. I'm not sure what the whiteness was. If someone could explain, that'd be awesome. Once I reached the hospital and was in the ER, I was alone with a nurse. Where, where am I? Oh, sweetie, you're in the hospital. Oh shit, I'm in the hospital, which one? You're in Miami Valley Hospital. Oh, thank God, I thought they were taking me to green. She had called my grandparents and they came to check on me. There was a bunch of tests, x-rays and scans being done throughout the night. Driver and his mom came and checked on me that night. He was really shaken up and upset. They had tried to roll me for bathroom, I don't remember, but I screamed out in pain and he flinched. That was the only time I saw him while I was in the hospital and nursing home. My dad told him not to visit me, and I told him that I wanted him there and to visit anyways. He didn't. Jerk. I had a bunch of friends come visit me. BFF tried to visit me, but I refused, because I thought I would try to throw something at her and hurt myself. At one point I had four ex-boyfriends standing at the foot of my hospital bed, my dad wasn't happy with that. In the end, I was in the hospital for a week. I had a severely dislocated hip instead of popping out like normal dislocations. My hip bone went through my pelvic ring. A cracked and broken pelvis and a broken elbow. That all had surgery with pins, plates and screws to repair them. I also had lacerations to my kidneys, chipped lumbar vertebrae and a collapsed lung. After my hip surgery, I developed drop foot. I was then sent to recover in a nursing home for three months, two of which I was bedridden. While in the nursing home, I developed a blood clot in my leg, and either sprained my ankle while in the nursing home getting transferred to the shower, sex swing looking thing, or the nerves woke up in my ankle weeks after the accident and then started to hurt. 
Front passenger was thrown through some trees and landed in a field about a hundred feet away. She was unconscious for three days, base skull fractures, head and chest trauma, and spinal fractures. She was in a back brace for two months, but didn't need to get any surgery and was able to recover from home. Driver had three stitches and some chemical burns on his arm. So far I've recovered fairly well. The third month in the nursing home I was relearning how to walk. I was on a walker for months and then a cane. I still have nerve damage in my left leg and can't move my foot very well. I've also gained a lot of weight from not being able to exercise or move around much due to pain. I have chronic pain in my hips and lower back. Medical marijuana, here I come. I also have memory issues and don't remember much from my childhood or teens. I also have severe depression and PTSD. For a while I couldn't ride with anyone and always had to drive. That's gotten better now. I'll be able to have kids if I decide to have any, but I will have to have a C-section. No charges were made. BFF came back and gave a really fucked up report that was inaccurate. Driver gave a report basically what I've said previously. I have copies of the reports, but I would have to hunt them down. The police never spoke to me. Front passenger couldn't remember what happened. Days after it happened, BFF messaged me saying the police said it was driver's fault. That we were speeding. No contact was actually made between the cars and there was no paint transfer. BFF said if I was siding with driver, we couldn't be friends anymore. I know BFF and her friend had beer in the car. And I didn't know it at the time, but apparently she was doing hard drugs as well. I'm a pretty naive person. I'm not sure if they were under the influence of anything when the accident happened. But that would explain why it took her an extra hour to come back. Still pissed she didn't get charged with anything. Anyway, so I don't know what spoke to me that night, or what grabbed me and pulled me out of the Bronco. I don't know if it was a spirit, a guardian angel, or what. I'm leaning towards that it was my boyfriend that passed away the year prior, but I'm not sure. I would love to see a psychic, but I'm not sure how to go about that. I also have a bunch of paranormal experiences growing up in my house. After my boyfriend passed away, there were weird occurrences as well. Like when me and friends and brother were playing with a pendulum, and everyone but me heard something say my name. Also, there is definitely a residual haunting that four people have seen in my house. I can go into detail about those experiences later. Two. So back in 2013, I worked in a call center, and the company had just brought on a new hire who filled the empty desk next to mine, we'll call him T. T and I quickly became super close friends, as if we'd known each other our whole lives. There was this strange familiarity to our friendship. I am saying was because he recently passed away. Rest in peace. One morning I was sleeping in my bed. I felt a gentle nudge on my arm and woke up to a sweet old man standing over me with a smile, whispering in a heavy Filipino accent. Wake up. You're going to be late. I only know this accent because T is Filipino and he always exaggerated the accent to make me laugh. Still half asleep, I didn't think anything of this strange man in my room and replied to him with a quick, thanks. As I sat up to check the time in my phone, he walked out of my room. I remember not feeling scared or threatened by this mysterious man, but almost like I knew him. When I looked at my phone, the time read 7.42 a.m., which meant I had less than 20 minutes to get up, get ready, and get to work. I flew out of bed, grabbed some random clothes, took the fastest shower of my life, got dressed and sat on the edge of my bed to put my shoes on. Before reaching for my shoes, I checked my phone one more time to see how much time I had before I had to leave the house. This is where it kind of gets weird. When I looked at my phone this time, the time said 3.15 a.m. Needless to say, I was extremely confused. I sat there in the edge of my bed, just staring at the clock on my phone, trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I went to the kitchen to check the clock on the stove and it also said 3.15 a.m. I was a little sleepy still, so I chalked it up to a weird dream state or lapse in memory thing. And decided to go back to bed since it was obviously way too early to go to work. I set an alarm and fell asleep. Fast forward to my alarm going off at the normal time, 7 a.m. I wake up, turn my alarm off and notice I have two missed calls and a text from T. The text message read, My dad died this morning at 3 a.m. 
I remember thinking to myself that it was odd of him to tell me the exact time, but I shrugged it off and called him to see how he was doing. He explained that his father had had a stroke and passed away in the hospital from complications related to that. Understandably, T took a few days off from work. When T returned to work, he asked me if I would accompany him to his dad's funeral service and I said yes. I had not met any of his family prior to the funeral, so this next part is completely unexplainable by me. The day of the funeral, I remember feeling nervous because I'm not a person of faith and honestly, churches make me very uncomfortable. The service was held in a traditional Catholic church, and T's whole family was there except for those who live in the Philippines. I felt like I was intruding, because I had never met the man whose funeral I was attending, and I was the only one there that didn't speak Filipino, so I couldn't really express my sympathy for their loss. As soon as I walked through the door into the church, there was a huge framed portrait of T's father. When I saw it, it felt like someone had knocked the wind out of me. I instantly broke down in tears, the man in the photo was the man who had woke me up at 3.15 in the morning just a few days prior. It was the same exact man, glasses, smile, and age spots on his cheeks. I still can't understand it. It took me a year to tell T about how his dad was in my room and woke me up at almost the exact time that he had passed away, in a completely different part of the country. When I told him, I was expecting him to look at me like I was nuts. But instead, he just broke down crying like he knew even thanked me. I don't know. It's definitely one of the strangest glitches I've had in my life. But at least now, T and his dad are together, wherever. 3. What I am about to tell you personally happened to me. Let me start by giving a brief on this building and why I was there. This building used to be a McDonald's warehouse, where they stored and packaged the products to be sent to the locations in the nearby area. It is a fairly large facility and was really long and has two floors. This facility turned into a place where car parts were shipped out, owned by a small local family. The husband had decided to give the wife a hobby and so she decided to open a pots and pans store. This is where I came in. I started working for her at the store towards the end of her closing. The brick and mortar didn't do well so she decided to go strictly online and I followed to the warehouse where she took over the right half of the upstairs building. The left half was the offices for the husband's business. The middle of the upstairs was at the time a bunch of large dark conference rooms filled with products from the store we had just moved from. Now onto the actual story. I was to be there for a few months helping move things from the middle of the upstairs to the far right side of the building where she had shelves set up so it would be easier for her to locate an item to be shipped. I am a very detail-oriented person, and so she trusted me with this task completely. After about a month of being there, things were moving along, but we still had a lot left to do. She had a family vacation planned and would be gone for about a month, so I would be left alone there to finish up things. Now, mind you, this upstairs was creepy as hell, and I hated going into this particular conference room because it just gave off this weird vibe. So I was kind of nervous she would be leaving, but just thought it is only a month, so no big deal. Up to this point, nothing really out of the ordinary had happened. So I had no solid reason to feel this way. The left side of the building had the husband's offices, and they were separated from my side of the building by a long hallway with motion sensor lights and two doors. One on my side and one on theirs. Each side had a stairway, so I rarely see the office girls unless they had to bring something to me. One day I am near the doorway which is right next to the stairs. I started hearing what sounded like someone walking down the hall. Which I thought was odd because the girls usually leave an hour earlier than this. So I peeked out into the hall and I see from the left side of the building the motion lights lighting up and coming in my direction. With no one I can visibly see and I could still hear the footsteps. Then right before the stairs it stopped. No sound. Nothing. I left early that day. I came back because obviously I couldn't leave my boss hanging while she is on vacation. Sometimes I wonder if I should have just quit earlier. I don't recall at what point in time this happened, but it was closer to the time of my boss coming back home. I had got mostly all the needed items stocked on shelves neatly organized and labeled. I was now in the process of making an itemized list of everything we had in stock into a spreadsheet. That way when she returned she knew what she had and how much. 
I realized at one point that I had seen more of a particular item that I needed to add to the stock. In that creepy conference room. I urged myself down to the room and prayed no one started walking invisibly down the hallway. I quickly ran over to grab the items and as I bent over I felt this odd burning sensation on my left shoulder. I ignored it and got the heck out of that room. I got back to what I was doing and forgot about the burning incident until I got home. I went to take a shower and caught a glance in the mirror of something on my shoulder. It was three scratch marks, two of them about two inches long and one about three inches. I tried to make sense of it, went back through my day to see when I could have done this to myself, and I just could not place a time that this could have happened. About a week later I am hanging out with two of my friends, and we were all walking when I felt this burning on my right forearm. I made a noise of pain and stated my arm was burning. We all looked at my arm and watched three scratch marks appear out of nowhere. I did not scratch myself, and up until the marks appeared, there was nothing but my white skin. 4. My grandfather never travelled a lot, but every time he did he always saw the same man on whatever mode of transportation he was using. He first saw the man on his way home from the military back in the 60s, on the plane he took. The man had grey hair and a wrinkly face. He wore a brown bowler hat and a brown wind coat, I think it's called. He carried a suitcase with him and the suitcase always had a little dent in the bottom left. My pa sat next to him and asked where he was going and the man responded that he didn't know. My pa brushed it off and got home normally. The next time he saw the traveler was when he was going to my mom's wedding up in Kansas. It was a couple years after the first time and when he got on the bus, sure enough, the man was there, suitcase and everything. He sat next to him again and asked if he remembered my pa. The man only nodded his head and continued to look out the window. He was there for the ride back too, but nothing eventful happened. The third time it happened was right before I saw him, and it was to go see my uncle while he was in the hospital. He saw the man again, and this time he actually asked what the man's name was. He responded with the name my pa calls him now. My pa then moved seats because he was unnerved by the whole thing. The final time, before my pa passed away, was when I was there to see him for myself. It was on a plane on the way to Kansas to see my mom and her new husband for her birthday. I went with him, I was twelve. We got on the plane and my pa pointed to the man as soon as he got on. I shit you not, he was there, and he was looking at the window in his seat. I sat with my grandpa across from him and before the plane took off, he nodded at my pa. Then he returned to his window looking. He had that damned briefcase on him just like Pa said and I could clearly see the dent. We got off the plane and Pa didn't say much about it after that. Surely if the man was as old as dirt in the 60s, then he would have been dead by now. I saw him in 2013. This is like a family story I try to keep in memory so I can honor my Pa. I haven't ridden a bus or a plane so I haven't seen him, but I am going to next Thursday and hope to see him to ask if he knows how my pa is doing. I feel like he would know. I also want to get a picture of him so I can post it here for evidence. Hope you got some joy out of the story, and if you are out there, I hope to see you in a bit. 5. It was a strange time in my life. I had just broken off an engagement and moved into a small apartment in downtown Portland. Autumn arrived and the city turned gloomy. I love gloomy Portland days when the air is slightly chilly and a subtle fog hangs over the city. I go for walks every day, whether that may be alone or with a friend. Moving keeps my mind steady away from all the sadness and regret. On a day where my heart is feeling particularly heavy, a friend calls me and asks me if I would like to spend the day together. I look outside the window and notice the dark clouds contrasting with the bright orange trees. It is a beautiful day to explore. I meet my friend Tim outside my building. We like to ride public transit to the end of the line and explore wherever we end up. I have gotten to know the city well from riding public transit and exploring since I moved here. Instead of waiting until the end of the line, my friend and I stopped midway to smoke a cigarette. This train was going to take us to Milwaukee, but we exited the train on the outskirts of Portland. After we get off at our stop, 
We look around and see if there is a decent place for us to relax and have a smoke. Across from the stop is a small pathway surrounded by trees. We walk down the path to an old train yard to smoke and watch the freight trains go by. The freight trains move slowly, and I wonder what it's like to jump on one and leave the city. I see young travelers every day in the city and wonder what the allure of hopping a train is. As we are finishing off our cigarette, a man in the distance is walking towards us. As he walks closer, I notice he is wearing a police uniform. My first thought is, oh god, he's going to tell us to leave. I hate dealing with police officers. He walks over with a warm smile and asks us how we're doing today. We tell him we are doing well. His expression changes from warm to concerned when he asks, What are you two doing here? We like watching the trains go by, it's relaxing. I say nervously, I'm not here to get you in trouble. I've seen a lot of people jump on those trains and die. Some of them wanted to die. Tim and I look at each other in confusion, wondering why he is trying to freak us out. Tim and I are curious about his intentions, so Tim asks, Did you think we were going to jump? I hope not. That's why I came by. I've seen a lot of bad things on this job. I saw a girl kill herself. We were unprepared for how morbid the conversation would be. I figured his only intention was to tell us to go home. Tim asks him, How long have you worked as an officer? Oh, before you were born, that's for sure. When he told us that, both of us felt uneasy, as if there was something hidden under that statement. Before we could come up with another question, the officer redirects the conversation. I have a family, a wife and kids. This seemed oddly out of context, but we kept the conversation going. Oh yeah, are you from here? He smiles. No, I'm from Florida. I really miss my family. I love them so much. Before we can ask him where his family is, he ends the conversation. Well, okay, kids. Take care of yourself, okay? Be good. I ask him his name before he leaves. Officer Acevedo. He drives off into the mist, and as soon as he exits the path, his car disappears. We do not see it on the main road, as if he drove off into space. We were startled and stood frozen. Days later, I searched the web for an Officer Acevedo, specifically listings of train officers. Train hoppers call them bulls. After an hour of searching, there is no Officer Acevedo to be found. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, episode 109. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use and sent in stories for use in this video. Well, it is Halloween night as I'm recording this. You guys will, of course, get this a few days later. Uh, thankfully, there's been no interruptions at the door. So, besides a few uh, fireworks been let off in the distance, uh, that'll be people getting prepped and overly excited for... Uh, but next Monday, I think, the 5th of November. Bonfire night? Yeah. Uh, well... And they'll probably keep at it right up until the new year. But still, as long as they don't make too much noise, they can do what they like. As long as they don't interrupt while I'm recording. Okay. And with that little grumble, I'll head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourselves.